Well, good morning, Rocky Peak. Great to see you. Uh, my name's Michael. If we haven't had a chance to meet yet, I'm one of the teaching pastors here too, and just so good to be with you today. Uh, hey, didn't Dre do a great job with the announcements? It's like, hey, last night I saw him as he went backstage and he said, it was like half a sermon, you know? And I said, yeah, you, know, you only got two more. Uh, but uh, hey, uh, just one real thing, uh, quick, quick thing too. I don't know if any of you were here for last Tuesday night for apologetics uh, seminar, but uh, you know, we had 950 people sign up for that. And uh, last week was just a home run. It was so amazing. The only reason I mention it is that if you've been on the fence about coming uh, and you thought, well, I kind of missed it, there's still time. You can still show up this week. Just show up at the door, sign up. Um, Sean McDowell's going to be there this next week. It's going to be another kind of kind of A game. Um, he's been talking about atheism, new atheism, how she pose as an atheist and kind of walks. It's going to be very, very engaging. And so I uh, just encourage if you're on, on the fence. But I'm ready to go into a time of teaching. You guys ready to go? Okay, let's pray. So, Father, we're just so thankful to be here in the room, and we're so thankful, Lord, that when, you, when we meet together, your word says that the power of the Lord is there, and we just acknowledge that, that when we gather together in this way, that this is not just a, a going through the motions. This is not just like a, like a political body meeting or a, a community group meeting. This is your church. It's like, this is your people. You're here, here with us. And so, Lord, we just acknowledge that you're our teacher, and we, we want to, to pray like the prayer of the book of Revelation, that, that, that those that have ears to hear would hear what the Spirit says to his church. And so we pray that you would be speaking and we'd be listening. We pray this in your name. Everyone said, amen. Well, our story starts today in a hospital, for, but for once, it's not about me. Uh, it's... Um, but uh, this story starts with a, a young nurse. Uh, she's in her mid to late uh, 20s. Uh, she, uh, she's been working at this hospital for a few years, and though she's, she's still young, and though she is also uh, fairly new, she's developed quite the reputation. Uh, she's kind of a uh, big personality, larger than life, uh, beautiful young woman, big red hair, um, and she, she's outgoing, she's fun-loving, um, she is hard-living, uh, and she's got uh, a reputation for quite the mouth as well. In fact, uh, when the doctors see her coming down the aisle, they know that chances are she's going to stop, stop them and share with them her, lady, her latest kind of raunchy joke, right, that they can share together. And now little does she know that she goes to work on this day, that on this day, she's going to meet um, another young nurse who's brand new. And then as a result of their meeting, that not only her jokes are about to change, but her whole life is about to change. Well, today we're continuing this series that we've been in called The Gospel of God. And for those of you who are brand new, I always like to take just a moment or two at the top just to kind of recap what this series is about so you can join us on the journey. So this, this series is an in-depth study of one of the greatest letters ever written. It's, it's part of the second part of our Bible, as we call the New Testament. It's a letter from one of the key leaders of the early movement of Jesus. His name is Paul or the Apostle Paul. He's writing to a group of Christ followers, most of whom he's never met. They live in the capital city of the Roman Empire. Uh, they're several hundred miles away from him. They live in the capital city of Rome. And so he called this letter the letter of Paul to the Romans. And in the opening, and then the very opening uh, sentence of the letter, he introduces the big picture topic, what he wants to talk to him about, what he calls the gospel of God, which is kind of what what we, why we call this series what we did, which is this kind of big picture story of God's epic rescue mission of a rebel race through the life and death and the resurrection of the Messiah of Israel, his son, through Jesus. And so if you were here last week, we, we jumped into one of the most important letters uh, of the gospel of God, or chapters rather, one of the most important chapters in all the Bible, and it's chapter 8 of Romans. So if you have your Bibles, you have your apps, just go ahead and open up, turn on, and there in your note sheet, you have a section called the gospel of God, the gift of the Spirit. So if you were here last week, uh, Paul kicked it off and said that when someone comes to Jesus, they go through a radical change in their life. Remember that he said that we're all born into Adam. We're all part of Adam's fallen human race. But, we, we're, but when we come to Jesus, that we are transferred kind of from Adam 
into Christ and we receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. And the reason that's possible was because Jesus took the condemnation of the rebel race. He took that condemnation on the cross and that opened the door for God now to send the spirit of his son into our life. When the spirit of his son comes, it transforms us and it empowers us to live kind of the Torah. It empowers us to live kind of the law of God that God gave to Israel. It can be summarized, as Jesus said, by loving God and loving people. Well, today Paul is going to continue to talk about what happens when the Holy Spirit comes into our life. In fact, this will be the second of a three-week trilogy on this topic of the Holy Spirit uh, in the first half of chapter 8. So we're going to pick up the the story at verse 5. So Paul says, Uh, Those who live according to the flesh. So in this passage we're looking at today, Paul is contrasting two different kinds of people, okay? The first kind of person is the person who's not yet come to Jesus. That person, by definition, is in Adam, part of the rebel race. Another way of describing it in Paul's language is they are in the flesh, okay? Okay. Now, he's contrasting that kind of person with the person who has come to Jesus. So that person is no longer in Adam. They're in Christ or in Paul's language, in the spirit. So this contrast he's going to be doing today is not the contrast of one person who's sometimes following the flesh and other times following the spirit. That's not the contrast. The contrast is between those who haven't yet come to Jesus and are in Adam with those who have come to Jesus are in the spirit. So he says... Those who live according to the flesh, so this person over here, the non-believer, their minds are set on what the flesh desires. So he says their whole mindset in life is set on what that fallen human nature wants. He says, but those who live in accordance with the spirit, this category of person, they have their minds set on what the spirit desires. Now, as we'll see, it doesn't mean that someone who's in the spirit always listens and follows the spirit, but there's a basic change of mindset. When someone comes to Jesus, something happens, it changes your perspective on who God is, who we are, and the path to life. So he he moves on, and so he says, the mind, verse, uh, verse six, the mind governed by the flesh, this person over here, uh, is death but the mind governed by the spirit is life and peace. This way of thinking leads to death. This way of thinking leads to life and peace. And he says, and the reason is the mind governed by the flesh, this person is hostile to God. Before we come to Jesus, whether we realize it or not, we're really at war with God. And the reason is we don't want anyone to run our life. We want to run our own life. We want to be our own God. And he says, so this person, it does, this mind doesn't submit to God's law, nor can it do so. And in fact, he says, those who are in the realm of the flesh, this person cannot please God. Okay? We're at war with God. Whether we realize it or not, we can't please him. He says, but he switches over to this kind of category of person. He's talking to his readers in Rome who are followers of Jesus. He said, you, however, are not in the realm of the flesh. So in the Greek, it literally says, you're not in the flesh. He says, but you're in the spirit, in the realm of the spirit, if indeed the spirit of God lives in you. And if anyone doesn't have the spirit of Christ, they do not what? Okay, great. Now you're at the 11 o'clock service, all right? I expect a little more of you. You've gotten two hours extra sleep. Um, So let's do that one again. He said, and if anyone does not have the spirit of Christ, they do not, what? They don't, now, did you catch that? What's you? He says, here's the difference between this person over here in Adam and this person over here in Christ. He says, this person doesn't have the Holy Spirit. And this person does. And that makes all the difference. And I want you to catch this, that often we've not understood this, that the gospel of God is not just that Jesus died for our sins so he could be forgiven. That was what opened the door for what comes next, which is the gift of the Spirit who gives us the power to commune with God, to know God, and to rise with him to a whole new life. And so he says in verse 10, okay, so... 
He says, so let's talk about this person over here. We've received the gift of the Holy Spirit. We have this new life. He says, but he said, if Christ is in you, so he, he kind of intersperses, like almost, uh, he says, Christ one moment, the spirit the next, spirit of Christ, right? So if Christ is in you, even though your body is subject to death because of sin, the spirit gives life because of righteousness. What he's saying is that when we come to Jesus, something supernatural happens at the inner core of our being, in our spirit. We're given new life. We'll talk about it later. But guess what? We don't get a new body yet, right? So for those of you who are under 21, uh, you may not have recognized this yet, but Paul calls our body the body of death, right? If you're under 21, you may not understand that, okay? <laughs> But after about 21, 25, we start going downhill, right? And so the older you get, the more you realize, oh, I've got a body of death. And this is not going to end well, right? So I have the Holy Spirit. I'm alive on the inside, but I've got this body of death. And what Paul wants us to understand is we live between the times. that On the inside, we've come alive, but we still have this body of death. It's a result of the sin of Adam and our own sin. And he says, but here's the good news in verse 11. And if the spirit of him who raised Jesus from the dead is in you, then he who raised Christ from the dead will also give life to your mortal bodies because of his spirit. This is where the story is going. We come to Jesus, we're made alive in the spirit, but when Jesus comes back, we'll receive new bodies like his body. His was the first of the new creation. When he comes back, we get a body like his. I like to call it 2.0, right? And we will be part of this new creation when he restores all of creation. And that's what we're going to read about in Romans 8, in the second half of Romans 8. Okay? So he'll come back to that in a little bit later. He says, therefore, so, so here's where we stand. Because we have the spirit now, we have this amazing future that's coming. He says, this is where it leaves us. He says, therefore, brothers and sisters, we have an obligation, but it's not to the flesh to live to it. For if you live according to the flesh... You will what? And we'll come back to that later. He said, but if, you, if by the Spirit, by the power of the Holy Spirit, he gives us the new desires and the new ability, if by the power of the Spirit you put to death the misdeeds of the body, then you will live. And he says, for all who are led by the Spirit of God are what? So catch this. What is the mark of a believer? What makes a believer a believer? The Holy Spirit. And how do you know if you have the Holy Spirit? Well, there's a whole new perspective on life, and you listen and follow the Spirit. So here he says that all who are led by the Spirit are children of God. In, in context, he's not talking about we're led by the Spirit in terms of decision-making. That's also true, but that's not what he's talking about here. He's, when he talks about being led by the Spirit, he means led by the Spirit to put to death the deeds of the body. He says, that's how you know who the two children of God are. They've received this spirit and they're putting to death the whole life. Their lives have changed, okay? So that's the passage. Now, what I want to do in the time that we have is I want to highlight two key principles that flow out of this about the role of the Holy Spirit in our life, what happens to us when we come to Jesus, and then I want to come back at the end and ask two really important, kind of powerful, profound questions. Number one, here we go. Uh, your note sheet, the gospel of God, the spirit of life, part two. Like I said, this is part two of a trilogy, so with all my creativity I could bear, we call them part one, part two, part three. So uh, we'll do part three next week. But anyway, number one. So the first thing Paul wants us to understand is that the Spirit gives new life. The Holy Spirit is the solution to the sin problem of the human race. That, that apart from Jesus, when we're in Adam, we can know the right thing, we can even want the right thing, but we don't have the power to change. That's what chapter seven was all about. When we come to Jesus, we receive the gift of the Spirit, and catch this, when, when the Spirit comes in our life, something supernatural happens to us. Like becoming a Christian is not like joining the Kiwanis. It's not like signing up for a new softball league. It's not like joining a political party. 
that when we follow, when we come to Jesus, something happens at the core of our being. It's deeply supernatural. And Paul says, when it happens, it changes our mindset. It changes the way we look at life. In fact, this is what he says. Let's look at chapter 8 and verse 5 in your Bible. He says, those who live according to the flesh, remember he's talking about this person over here who's not yet come to Christ. They have their minds set on what the flesh desires, but those who live in accordance with the Spirit have their minds on what the Spirit desires. There's a fundamental outlook change of life. Who is God? Oh, Oh, how do we know him? What's our relationship? How do we live out this new life he's come to give us? Now, the supernatural change that Paul is describing here, and he describes it in very simple terms. He's either in the spirit or you're in the flesh. But the supernatural change, the biblical writers, Jesus, Paul, the apostles, they use a wide variety of metaphors to describe this. So for example, Uh, Maybe you've heard of this one. Paul says in 1 Corinthians 6 that as followers of Jesus, we are a temple of the Holy Spirit. Are you familiar with that one? We're a temple. So what's he saying? In the Old Testament, they built a temple. They offered the sacrifices to cleanse the temple to make atonement. And then once that was done, the Spirit of God came to dwell in the temple. And he says, that's what happens when we come to Jesus. Our our bodies, our literal bodies become a temple of the Holy Spirit who comes to dwell in us. Uh, Another analogy that Paul will use is the new creation. In 2 Corinthians 5, he says that when someone comes to Jesus, it's like the new creation that's going to start when Jesus comes back, it actually starts on the inside for that person. The new creation has come. Um, I put on your note sheet another couple analogies that Paul uses that we often don't talk about. It's in Titus chapter 3. Titus was a young pastor that uh, Paul was part of his ministry team. He left him on the island of Crete to oversee the developing house churches there. And he writes this letter, and Paul says, he saved us, uh, God saved us. Now catch these terms, these metaphors, through the washing of rebirth and renewal by the Holy Spirit that he poured out on us generously. So we come to Jesus, he pours out the Holy Spirit generously, and he says, so what does the Holy Spirit do? Well, he says, he, first thing he does, he kind of washes us. He cleanses us. Right? But he says, it's also like a new birth, like we're born again. It's like a fresh start in life. Something happens. Now, this analogy, the metaphor of the new birth, of course, goes back to Jesus himself. You remember in John chapter 3, a religious leader comes to Jesus. Remember, Jesus was, his whole message was about the coming of the kingdom of God. So this religious leader named Nicodemus comes to him and says, hey, can we talk about the kingdom of God? And here's what what Jesus said to him. He said, very truly, and remember in the Greek, that's amen, amen, What Jesus says when he's about to say something really important, he said, amen, amen, I tell you, no one can enter the kingdom of God unless they are what? Born, circle that, born. Something has to happen. He says they have to be born of the water and the what? The spirit, so the spirit gives us birth, right? And he says, and here's why, flesh gives birth to flesh. Adam gives birth to Adam, but only the spirit gives birth to the spirit. And so what I want you to understand is that what Paul is saying is that when we come to Jesus, we receive the Holy Spirit, and with the Holy Spirit, he brings the DNA of Jesus, which changes our whole outlook on life. It's a supernatural thing, and we've seen this. Uh, Every time we do a baptism, uh, you see this. Like last, last time we did a baptism a few weeks ago, and uh, we baptized almost 100 people. It's kind of a big one, right? Kind of, uh, we've, ne- we've like almost never done that. Anyway, uh, I, it was in, last time we had a next step dessert for newcomers to Rocky Peak. And, uh, and one of the ladies there shared that she'd, she'd kind of grown up in church, but went away from it for a really long time. But through a series of events, she came to Rocky Peak. And the first time here was the, bat- the last baptism. And she listened to these stories, and there was one in one service, you may remember, I can't remember what service it was in, but there was one service where there was a a younger woman 
who was sharing how she'd come to Christ but was still really struggling to accept kind of shame and freedom, a freedom from shame. And if you were here at that service, we just stopped the service and said, let's just pray for her right now. And it was just a really beautiful moment. And she said, when I saw that, I knew this was the place for me. I've been looking for real Christianity. I've been away for so long. And if you're here during a baptism, you hear stories of changed lives, don't you? It's not like that, that one after another come up. Every story is different, but people share what's happened in their life because Jesus came into their life. It's supernatural. And you, you, you see this. You know, we started the day with a story of this, this nurse, right, that uh, has, has kind of worked in this unit of just a few years, but she, she's kind of big personality, has such a big impact. Everyone knows her. I kind of gave the description. You know, she's, uh, she's, she's kind of loves life. Uh, she is a uh, great sense of humor, hard living, you know, kind of, you know, she kind of, she'll, she'll dabble with substance abuse. She's living with her boyfriend and so on. And, and so uh, I shared her story. This is a true story. It's a story from our life. So, you know, Lynn and I got married young and, and we got married, uh, I was just after my freshman year of college. And so we were both in the midst of school. And so I, I came back to Southern California and put her through Biola. She was in a five-year nursing program. And then when we, she finished, we went back to Wheaton outside Chicago uh, for me to f- finish my education. And so when we graduated, we came back to Southern California. And since my folks were, were living in Orange County, we, we went to Orange County. And I, was still, I wasn't sure what God was going to do in my life. I was 23. I loved Jesus. I loved the word. Uh, uh, we were experiencing the power of the Holy Spirit. We were doing Bible studies. I didn't really know what I was going to do with my life. Maybe some ministry somewhere. Not really sure. And, uh, but Lynn, of course, was a labor and delivery nurse by this time. She knew what she wanted. And so, so she took a job as a labor and delivery nurse at, a, at this uh, hospital in Orange County. And so when she gets there, she meets the woman I shared about this story. Her name, let's, let's call her Sue. Right? Let's call her Sue because that was her name. But... Uh, <laughs> And these two women can't be, like, more different. Like, if you know my wife, you know, this is not. And so they're really different, but they just hit it off, and they become friends. And it was, it was really funny because what Sue loved to do in those early days she met Lynn is she would be walking with Lynn down the hall. And Lynn's brand new. And so, so Sue's going to introduce them to the doctors. But, of course, the doctors know that Sue is always going to have the ladies, latest raunchy sexual joke, Right. And so they're used to that. And so she comes up and she would tell them the latest joke. And then while they're busting a gut laughing, she'd say, oh, and this is my friend Lynn. She's new. Her husband's going to be a preacher. <laughs> and she would just watch as all of a sudden these doctors, woo, they're trying to take it back and act like that wasn't funny, you know? <laughs> and uh, so this is Sue. And so, if, so we got to know Sue. She's living with a guy who's a bodybuilder, and so we got to know him, and we went out a couple times with him and started building a friendship. And just a few months into this relationship, Sue calls Lynn one day, and she says, I've been watching your life, and you have a peace in your life that I've never experienced. And she said, I want what you have. What is it? And Lynn was able to share. And Lynn said, well, the only thing I can think of is Jesus, right? And then began, and shortly after that, we got a call one day from Sue. And what we didn't know is her bodybuilder husband was also an alcoholic. And when he got drunk, he became an angry, violent alcoholic. And so she called us terrified one day because he was on a rage in their apartment. He broke in a mirror. There was shattered glass all over. She was scared for her life. And so we said, we'll be right there. So we're driving over there, and I have a little bit of concern. Remember, I'm 23. (laughs) I'm going to the home of a bodybuilder (laughs) who has glass in order to say, I'm taking your girlfriend away from you, right? But you're 23 and you love Jesus, so you just go. So, <laughs> so when we get there, fortunately, we built enough, for, I didn't know how he'd respond, but fortunately, that there was a respect level there that he had for us. 
that he just kind of pulled back and we talked to her and he said to her, Sue, you, you need to get out of here. And she goes, I don't know where I'd go. And he said, why don't you come live with us? And so we just moved her out that day. She moved into our little apartment with us. And it was just beautiful to watch her come to Jesus. And just to watch her life change. Like no one had to talk to her about change. It just started changing. Like not everything. Like it's funny because we do Bible studies with her like pretty much every day. And whenever she'd get really excited about something God was showing her, she would start praising God, but in the four-letter words of her old life. Right? <laughs> She's like, that is so awesome, blankety, blank, blank, blank. And I would just laugh because I knew what was happening. Like Gabriel up there has a Google translator, and he's like, da, 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 da. it's high praise. You know, it's like translated into high praise. It was not even concerned about that because we just know like those are like the leaves of late fall. They're just going to come off with this new season, the spring that's coming. There was much bigger fish to fry. But you know, as we watched Sue in those months, it's just like her life began to change. You know, she was brash and just loud before and like larger than life and big life, but there was a hardness to her too. It was a harshness. And we just watched, it's like the lines in her face just began to relax. And she began just this new love, this new peace, this new joy in her life. And it all began to change. And this is what Paul is saying. When someone comes to Jesus, something happens. And if you became, came to Jesus when you're four years old, you may not have been real aware of that change. But if you're older, you, you know it's like a new perspective, a new outlook on life, who God is, who we are, a new path to life. So Paul says that when the Spirit comes, he is the Spirit of life. He gives new life. Whether you call it new birth, whether you call it washing, you can call it the temple, the Holy Spirit, a new creation, but something happens, and it's supernatural. Number two. The second principle is that the Spirit not only gives new life at the beginning, but the Holy Spirit leads to life. This is his ongoing role in our life. Remember what Jesus said, I have come to give you life and life to the full. And he said, when I leave, I'll send the Holy Spirit to teach you. And so this is the role of the Holy Spirit in our life to lead us into life, to lead us into the peace that Jesus came to give us. You know, there in your note sheet, Romans 8, 2, you remember what, what Paul called the Spirit at the beginning. He said, through Christ Jesus, the law of the Spirit who gives life, right? But remember, in the Greek, it's the law of life. And he not only gives life, he leads to life. And there in your note sheet, the next verse, for, uh, Romans 8, 6, uh, this is my own translation from the Greek, kind of very literal. It was funny because I put it in my note sheet this week, and Mally, my assistant, came in and said, like, hey, it doesn't have any reference, like what version? And I thought, yeah, I was just going to say it's mine. But we decided since we have an uh, NIV, an ESV, an NESV, we just call this the MDY version. <laughs> but this is what it literally says. It says, the mind of the Spirit is life and peace. In other words, when we're listening and following the Spirit, this is where he wants to lead us. He wants to lead us to life to the full, the life we're created to live. He wants to lead us to that place of peace, peace with God, peace with others. This is his job. But what we learned last week, and that Paul says again this week, is that this change is not automatic. Just because we've received the Holy Spirit doesn't mean we'll always listen to the Holy Spirit. In fact, he talks about this in verse uh, 13 and 14. Let's look at it again there in your note sheet. He said, if you, uh, if you live, notice that word if, circle that. If you live according to the flesh, you will die. But if by the spirit you put to death the mystery, you will live. Do you see that if there? He, he's saying that before we come to Jesus, we're in Adam. We don't have the, really the ability to escape our rebellion. But when we come to Jesus, we've been set free. Now we have a choice. If we live by the Spirit, if we put to death by the power of the Holy Spirit, we put to death our old life. 
You know, Paul talks about this more in his letter to the Galatians, and I'd like you to turn there in Galatians chapter five. We'll pick it up at verse 16. But look what Paul says about the flesh and the spirit here in this letter. In verse 16, he says, so I say, walk by the spirit, right? As we would say here, listen and follow the spirit. But walk by the spirit. That's the choice, isn't it? We can either choose to walk by the spirit. Of course, walk is a common metaphor for living, how to live your life. So walk by the Spirit, and you will not gratify the desires of the flesh. If you just listen and follow what the Spirit's telling you, then you don't have to worry about the flesh. It's going to lead you in the opposite direction. So for the flesh desires what is contrary to the Spirit, and the Spirit what is contrary to the flesh. They're in conflict with each other. Skip down to verse 19. So the acts of the flesh are obvious, Paul says, but I'm still going to list them out for you. He says, so like here would be sexual immorality, which of course in the Bible, when Jesus, sex outside of marriage, one man and one woman, any kind of sex would be sexual immorality. He says, so that's a work of the flesh. Um, So sexual immorality, impurity, uh, debauchery, idolatry, witchcraft. Then he switches gears and talks about relational issues in the flesh, how we do our relationships. Hatred, discord, jealousy, fits of rage, selfish ambition, dissensions, factions, and envy. Then he skips back to the more obvious, like you can see them in life, drunkenness, orgies, and the like, those sorts of things. And that's what he says, I warn you, as I did before, that those who live like this will not what? You're not going to come to the kingdom. So Paul is always very clear. And this is what he's saying back in 8.13. He says, here's the person who comes to Jesus is no longer in the flesh. They're in the spirit. And he says, but you have a choice to make. Are you going to live by, are you going to put to death the Jesus of the flesh? Or are you going to kind of live in the flesh? And he says, if you're just going to live by the flesh, you're going to die. Not just now, but eternally. And it's what he's saying here. And this is important because I think there are many people that, that are, have really, uh, we'll talk about this more later, but there are many people who kind of see themselves as good with God because at one point in their life, they prayed a prayer in junior high. They went forward at a harvest crusade when they were just, it was a very emotional moment. Maybe it's a retreat. Maybe here at Rocky Peak, they filled out a connect card or whatever. I want to follow Jesus. But, but their mindset has never really changed. So they're still living over here. And Paul says, hey, don't be deceived. Don't be deceived. If this is who you, how you're, who you are in your life, that's who you are. And you're not part of the kingdom. But he lays out this this. There's this change that has to happen. Let's keep going in in chapter 5. So he says, um, but the fruit of the Spirit, like how do you know when someone's listening and following the Spirit? Well, this is the kind of fruit the Holy Spirit will produce. Love, joy, peace, not just with God, but with or with ourselves, but with others. Forbearance, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. Skip down to verse 25. He says, so since we live by the Spirit, let's keep in step with the Spirit. And so Paul says that this is, the, this is why we've been given the Holy Spirit. He's, given, he's come to give us life. And that's his ongoing assignment. And he says, you can, what it means to be led by the Spirit and to be a child of God is to be listening to the Spirit as he leads us to this new life that Jesus died to give us. Now, this leads then to two very important questions. So there in your note sheet, there's a section, and it's called The Gospel of God, Two Key Questions. (laughs) 
And this first question, um, I want to, before I give you the question, I want to speak to those of you who have a very sensitive conscience. Over the years, as a pastor, I've seen this, that, that there are some people who have an insensitive conscience. They're living in sin, and you feel like, oh, we're fine with Jesus, right? That, like a lack of a sin. But there's other people that really love Jesus. They love his word. They're trying to follow him, but their life's not all together, and they're constantly questioning whether they've come to Christ or not. And usually when I'm talking with someone that, and they're saying, I love the word, they love coming to church, I love growing, but they're, just, they're struggling in this particular area that can't seem to, it's like, hey, I tell them like, hey, non-believers don't struggle like that. The sign of your struggle, the sign this is really, bother, this is a sign of the Holy Spirit in your life, right? So, so I want to give that little caveat before we jump in, because I'm just concerned for those of you who may have a very, very sensitive Subject, uh, conscience, you're, you're really, uh, like you're not very secure in your relationship with Jesus, um, and I don't want to make that worse for you, okay? so I just want to put caveat around this, but here's the question. The question is, do you have the Holy Spirit? Do you have the Holy Spirit? So what Paul says today is so powerful, one of the most powerful passages in all the scripture defining what does it mean to be a Christian? One way to define what it means to be a Christian is a Christian is someone who's received the Holy Spirit. This is why Paul says in verse 9 there, if someone does not have the Spirit of Christ, he doesn't belong to him. This is a separator. This is what separates those in Adam from those in Christ. They, these have not received the Spirit. These have the promise of the Father Remember what Jesus said, or John the Baptist said, I come to baptize you with water for repentance, but after me comes one who will baptize you in the Holy Spirit. The gift of the Spirit is what defines who a believer is. And what Paul says, when the Spirit comes, something happens to you, it impacts your whole mindset. So the, you think different. When, you, you, when you're over here, you thought this way. Now you think this way. It impacts the way you look at all of life. And so the question is, well, you know, well, okay, so how do I know if I have the Holy Spirit? Well, it's really interesting because um, remember earlier we looked in John chapter 3 where Jesus said that you have to be born again by the Spirit. Well, okay, so how do you know if that's happened in your life? What's interesting is the author of John's gospel, the Apostle John, he also wrote three little letters in the New Testament, 1st, 2nd, and 3rd John. And in 1st John, he gives several markers of here's signs that someone's been born again. And we don't have time to go through all of them, but I want to highlight three of them for you. And for each of them, I'll just give you a single example of what John says, but there are more examples and there are more verses for each of these, okay? So there in your note sheet, you have a section that's called the signs of the new birth. And for each one, I'm going to give you a key word and then talk about it, right? So the first key word is Jesus, okay? That John says that when someone is born again, one of the signs is the Holy Spirit has opened their eyes to who Jesus is. They have a new understanding of who Jesus is, why he's come, and so on. So an example of this would be 1 John 5, where it says, everyone who believes that Jesus is the Christ. So what does the word Christ mean? Messiah. Good. Yeah. So the word Christos in Greek is the same as Mashiach in Hebrew. They both mean the anointed one or the Messiah. And so John says, everyone who believes that Jesus is the Messiah, and of course, he's by this point in the letter already defined that Jesus died for our sins and so on. You know, he's the son of God. But he says, everyone who believes that Jesus is the Messiah is born of God. It's interesting, the apostle Paul says something very similar in 1 Corinthians chapter 12. He says, no one can say Jesus is Lord and he doesn't mean like just say the word, just say the word, Jesus is Lord. He's, he's not, no one can say it and mean it, right? No one can say Jesus is Lord except by the Holy Spirit. So one of the things that the Holy Spirit does is he opens our eyes to who Jesus is, why he's come, his death, and so on, right? 
A second key word is the word love. John says this several times in this letter that a mark of someone being born again is to have this new love for God, but especially a new love for others in the family of God, for their brothers and sisters. Now, of course, whenever we talk about love, we have to say that that the way the Bible defines love and the way our culture defines love is very different. Like our culture says love is love. Love is basically just an approval of whatever lifestyle you want, and that's love. In the New Testament, in Jesus, love has moral content, If you truly love someone, you're going to help them align with what God has called them to do. You're going to seek their best, right? You're going to say, hey, well, I'm on drugs. Well, I love you. I'll just give you more drugs. You know, that's not real love. So, um, So, but what John says over and over is one of the marks that someone's been born again is this new love. And I'll give you one example there uh, on your note sheet. Everyone who loves has been, there's, there's a word, born of God. And knows God. And he says this several different times. Uh, the third key word is the word righteousness. But one of the things happen when we're born again is we have a new moral compass, a new sense, a heightened sense of what's right and what's wrong. It's very intuitive. Many things that used to seem right now seem clearly wrong. Many things that once would have seemed wrong or now seemed right, and no one has to even tell us this. It's just like an intuitive sense of, hey, what's right, what's wrong. And of course, that would be educated as we go along, but there's a basic new sense of righteousness. So John puts it this way. No one who is born of God, notice that language, will continue to sin. Now, he doesn't mean that we will never sin. If you've read chapter 1 and chapter 2, he's already talked about that. Here's what to do when you sin, stuff like that. So, but what he's saying is that we're not going to be living in this lifestyle of sin that we used to live in, and we're okay with that. Right? He says, and look what he says. He uses the metaphor and develops it even more. No one who is born of God will continue to sin catch it, because God's what? His seed. He's like his sperm. Right? How do you get born? It's like the seed of the man, right? So that's a biblical term. So he says it's because God's seed, like I like to say with his DNA, uh, remains in them and they cannot go on sinning because they've been born of God. There's a new uh, heart. There's a new desire to please God. There's a new sense of righteousness, right? So I think this is important Because I think often, especially in our country, I think there are a lot of people that would see themselves as Christians and born again, and there's no evidence for it in their lives. In fact, if you if you believe the surveys, surveys that probably 65, 70 percent, I don't know, they they're very, very would call themselves Christians. And I'm looking and saying, well, at least here in Southern California, I'm not seeing it, right? And for all those people who fled, uh, fled California for a better life, they aren't either, right? <laughs> right? Not in this, in the sense of real uh, pursuit of Jesus. It might be different in other ways, but a pursuit. So, uh, so I think this is a really important question because we, 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 want, if we, we, we need to know, are we in Adam or are we in Christ? And Paul says, well, the way that you know is by the Holy Spirit. Has he changed your outside? And are you, are you letting the Spirit put to death the deeds of the flesh? That's how you can tell who's the children of God or not. And so this is important that we don't just assume because, hey, I grew up in a Christian home or because I go to church or I'm in a life group or whatever the thing is. Because I, I raised my hand one time in a meeting or went forward to be prayed for. That we don't assume that. Those are all good things. But, but the signs that someone has been born again is a new mindset and a desire to put to death the deeds of the flesh by the power of the Spirit. All right. Now, the second question. Let's say that you, you say, no, I do have the Holy Spirit. In fact, when I came to Jesus, I saw those kinds of changes. And again, if you came to Jesus when you were very young, you, know, you don't see this drastic change often. But if you came to Jesus later in life, you probably have seen this, and you, you can look, yeah, I saw that. I've experienced the Holy Spirit at times. I, I had a new love for the Word. The Word began to speak to me, and, and I sensed God in worship at times, and I've had some experience with the Holy Spirit. I'm pretty sure that's happened to me. Well, this question's for us. Does the Holy Spirit have you? So the first question 
is do you have the Holy Spirit? But the second question is, does the Spirit have you? And what we're going to see is it's possible to have come to Jesus, receive the Holy Spirit, and yet what Paul was saying in Galatians 5, not be walking according to the Spirit. And therefore, we're not experiencing the life and peace that the Spirit comes to give us. A great example of this is the church in Corinth. So Paul had served the church of Corinth, had a mighty move of the Spirit there. In fact, when he writes back in 1 Corinthians, he talks about how God met them and how they don't, they're not lacking any gift of the Spirit. They have a lot of gifts of the Spirit in the church. So, so it's very clear they received the Holy Spirit. But when he gets to chapter 3, this is what he says. He says, but I, brothers, could not address you as spiritual people. And in the Greek, it's like people of the Spirit, right? Not just like a general spirituality, but like people led by the Spirit. I could not address you as spiritual people, but as people of the flesh. Like you're still acting like the old life as infants in Christ, for you're still of the flesh. You know, it's not in the flesh, but of the flesh. For, and he says, well, how do you know? He says, how, do you, how can I tell this? He said, well, because there's jealousy and strife amongst you. Remember back in Galatians 5 and the works of the flesh, he starts with the obvious things, sexual immorality and so on. But then remember he went into that relational section, hatred, dissensions, envies, selfish ambition. He says what's happening in church, what they were doing is they were, they were fighting and dividing up over their favorite teachers as if they were like different schools of philosophy from their past. I'm of the school of Peter. I'm of the school of Paul. I'm of the school. And they're dividing the whole body. We're, we're smarter than you are because we follow Peter and he's better than Paul. You know, he says, that, that's all flesh. The spirit's not leading that division. And, it, and he says, for while there's jealousy and strife, are you not of the flesh and behaving only in a human way? You're acting like you're in Adam. And as you go through that letter, it's not just the divisions. It's like they're living in the flesh in all kinds of areas. Like in chapter 5, there's a, a blatant case of sexual immorality in their church. They all know about it, but no one's, everyone's just kind of letting it go. No big deal. Paul says, what are you thinking? Chapter 6, at the start, they're suing each other and taking each other to court before unbelievers. Paul says, what are you thinking? The end of chapter six, some of them are still going to the pagan idol temples and having sex with the sacred prostitutes there. I was like, what are you thinking? In chapter eight through 10, there's some of them are still going to the pagan uh, uh, temples and participating in the dinners there that were sacrificing to the gods. So what are you thinking? In chapter 10 and 11, he says, in your meetings, you get together to share these love feasts, these agape love feasts, and you, you celebrate the Lord's Supper, but the poor are going hungry while the rich are getting drunk. In chapter 12 through 14, they're exercising the supernatural spiritual gifts, but instead of using them to serve one another, they're using them to build up their own egos of how great they are. And when you get to chapter 15, there's some of them that are questioning this core teaching of the gospel that one day we'll have resurrected bodies. So Paul says that you've come to Christ, you've received the Spirit, but you're not walking by the Spirit. And as a result, there's chaos in your lives. You're not experiencing life and peace. You're not experiencing the new life of Jesus. Your life is a mess. And the reason is you have the Holy Spirit but the Holy Spirit doesn't have you. So what's the mark of a believer? The mark of a believer is somewhere listening and following the Spirit. And you know what? As we do that, the Holy Spirit is going to be slowly transforming our lives in every area. He doesn't usually choose all areas at once. That would overwhelm us. But the Holy Spirit just gently, as we listen, listen and follow him, he, he begins to refurbish and remodel each different room of, of the house of our lives, our relationships, our sexuality, our finances, our attitudes, our actions, our priorities, our values. And the Holy Spirit just leads us step by step to life and peace. And so the question is, 
Not just do you have the Spirit, but if you do, does the Spirit have you? Amen? Amen. Let's pray. So, Father, we're just so thankful for the beauty of your word and the insight and wisdom it gives us. And while we're here right now and all our heads are bowed and our eyes are closed, you know, we're going to be singing this beautiful worship song. And uh, some of you will recognize it. It's not a song we've done a lot, but it's a song called The Dove. And it talks about the role of the Holy Spirit throughout the story of, of the Bible. You know, in the Hebrew, it says right in Genesis 1 that, that the Spirit of God was hovering, you know, like a, like a bird fluttering over creation, calling forth beautiful things. And of course, then comes the, the great flood with Noah, and Noah sends out the dove, the symbol of the Holy Spirit, to see if it was safe to come out yet. And we move in the New Testament, and Jesus at his baptism, the Spirit like a dove descends on him. Later on, Jesus is called the vine, we're the branches. And of course, we're told that if we're a follower of Jesus, Christ lives in us. And so the song talks about the spirit like a dove coming to rest on the Christ in us, as it did on Jesus, to empower us to live new life, just like for him, to come forth in the power of the spirit in his life, to lead us to life. And my guess is in a room like this, for those of you joining us online, there's, I mean, we're all over the map. Like some of us may be, hey, I'm not sure I'm even a believer yet. I, I'm not sure I have the Holy Spirit. Some of us might be, yeah, I, I, I believe I've received the Holy Spirit, but like the prodigal, I'm in a far and distant land. There's no question I'm living in the flesh. I need to come home. Others of us may be, yeah, I've received the Holy Spirit and there's something blatant in my life that's wrong, but I'm just not... I'm just not growing. I'm not hungry. I I don't see the passion for Jesus and for his kingdom and for knowing him and loving others and being used by him. And and then there might be others of us here that we're just right where we need to be and yet there's a hunger for more. We just want more. And so today as we go into this time of worship, I want to encourage you to let this song speak to you Ask the Holy Spirit to be with you and, and just you just speak to him the prayer of your heart. Like, where are you at with the Holy Spirit today? He's come to give us life. But it only comes as we listen and follow. We keep in step with the Spirit. And so may this be a beautiful time of worship, a beautiful time of prayer as we ask the Holy Spirit to come and anoint us in a fresh way. You know, Jesus once taught on the Holy Spirit, and he he said that, he said, you fathers, you know how to give good gifts to your children, even though you're evil. He said, like if your son asks for a roll, you don't give him a rock to kind of confuse him. If he asks for a small little fish, you don't give him a scorpion. He said, if if you being evil know how to give good, good gifts to your children, how much more will the Holy Spirit or will the Father give the Holy Spirit to those who ask him? So if you want a deeper walk with the Holy Spirit, then this is a time to ask. But here's what I can say is that for the Holy Spirit to fill our temples, we have to remove any idols. So when he comes, don't be surprised if he says, okay, but this, this idol needs to go. If I'm going to fill this temple, we need to cleanse the temple. So let's use this as a beautiful time just to be with the Lord, to ask the Holy Spirit to speak and meet us. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.